Ah, Boris, look at that. Ah, a Frankenstein monster, two foot tall. Well, we have one, but you know, you could always use another one. <laughs> it is, after all, this time of year, Yule, where dear Krampus and Santa Claus will be bringing us wonderful presents of, well, werewolves and vampires and ghouls. <laughs> and of course, we're drooling over our wish book the Monster Collectible Toys wish book. <laughs> I mean, really, you have to get the drool bib out <laughs> for, for me, Boris. Hmm? <laughs> Did you see a lot of things in the, in the uh, catalog there that you would love to have? I bet you did. Did you make a list? Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, welcome and welcome, welcome, welcome to Season's Greetings Happy Yule, Merry Christmas, and Kwanzaa, and all the rest. I think we've got our bases covered, eh, Boris? <laughs> That's right. Monsters enjoy this time of year. So after all, Santa Claus and Krampus wouldn't forget people like Boris and myself. He never has. <laughs> Half of the uh, things in the museum here uh, have been brought to from Krampus and uh, Santa Claus, eh, Boris? And of course, you and my wife, Melissa, and all the family members and friends and fiends. <laughs> I tell you, it's beginning to look so festive outside, and each year I say the same thing. I'm beginning to feel so, so festive and, and, makes a chill go right down my spine. That's the only redeeming factor that I can think of, that the chills just go up and down my spine. <laughs> uh, you know, this year always reminds me of my uh, uh, Uncle Scrooge. He, uh, well, you know, he always saved up and saved up and was so grungy and stingy, and yet he, after having those visits from those ghosts, he seemed to turn right around. I, you know, we've had films about good old Uncle Scrooge over the years, quite a few of them actually. I thought we'd have another one. That's right, a 1951 uh, Lewis Carroll S Scrooge. <laughs> it's a wonderful film too. It's it, it each each film has a special telling of its own, right, Boris? I mean, no two are exactly alike, and tonight's feature is no different. <laughs> Let us tune in to the old internet uh, keyboard here, and let's put it in. That's right, 1951, Scrooge by Lewis Carroll. Excellent, excellent. Now, whoops, let's not knock that off boards. Be very careful. <laughs> we don't want to have to have Santa and Krampus bring us another one. <laughs> Although two would be, be really nice. But anyway, let's tune in to the old internet haunted TV and see if we can't see tonight's feature, Scrooge. Did your mama tell you not to turn on the TV at night? How dare you? Ah! <laughs> I've been watching you. <laughs>
Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. The register of his burial was signed by Scrooge, and Scrooge's name was good on the London Exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Ah, Mr. Scrooge. Your servant, sir. Are you off home to keep Christmas? I am not in the habit of keeping Christmas, sir. Then why are you leaving so early? Because, sir, Christmas is a habit of keeping men from doing business. Come, it's the nature of things that ants toil and grasshoppers sing and play, Mr. Scrooge. An ant is what it is and a grasshopper is what it is. And Christmas, sir, is a humbug. Good day. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge, sir. Who are you? Samuel Wilkins, sir. Oh, yes. You owe me a little matter of 20-odd pounds, I believe. Well, if you want to pay it, come to my place of business. I don't conduct my affairs in the teeth of inclement weather. I, I can't pay you, sir. I'm not surprised. Not unless you give me more time. Did I ask you for more time to lend you the money? Oh, no, sir. Then but... why should you ask me for more time to pay it back? No, I can't take my wife to a debtor's prison. Then leave her behind. Why should she go to a debtor's prison anyway? She didn't borrow the 20 pounds, you did. What has your wife got to do with it? For that matter, what have I got to do with it? Good afternoon. But Mr. Scrooge, it's Christmas! Christmas has even less to do with it, my dear sir, than your wife has or I have. You'd still owe me 20 pounds if you're not in the position to repay if it was the middle of a heat wave in August bank holiday. Good afternoon. Addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. In fact, he died seven years ago this very day. Oh. Well, we have no doubt that his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. I wish I could say they were not. And the treadmill and the poor law, they're still in full vigor, I presume? Both very busy, sir. Oh, from what you said at first, I was afraid that something had happened to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. I don't think you quite understand us, sir. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. Why? Because it is at Christmas time that want is most keenly felt and abundance rejoices. Uh, what can I put you down for? <laughs> Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, sir, that is my answer. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. And some would rather die. <sighs> if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, it's not my business. Isn't it, sir? No. It is enough for a man to understand his own business without interfering with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Who's that? Your nephew, Uncle. <coughs> it's you, is it? Well, what do you want? Neither to borrow money or beg a mortgage, Uncle. Only to wish you a Merry Christmas. Keep Christmas in your own way and leave me to keep it in mine. <laughs> but you don't keep it. Then let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you to keep it. Much good it has ever done you. It's certainly done me no harm. No, your wayward nature has done that. And your marriage? My marriage was the making of me. The ruin of you, you mean. Why don't you come and see for yourself, if you won't take my word for it? Come and dine with us tomorrow. No, thank you. But why? Why? Why did you marry against my wishes? Because I fell in love. You fell in love with a woman as penniless as yourself. Oh, good evening. <laughs> We've never had any quarrel that I've ever been party to. I ask nothing of you. I came here in the spirit of right goodwill, and I won't let you dampen it. So a Merry Christmas to you anyway, Uncle. Good evening. And a Happy New Year. Good evening. Humbert! How is Mrs. Cratchit and all the smaller sorted Cratchits? 
Very well, sir, thank you. All champing at the bit for Christmas to begin, eh? Oh, yes, sir. All very eager. And the little lame boy, which one is he? Tim, sir. That's right. How is he? Oh, we're in high hopes. He's getting better, sir. Good. A Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, sir, and a Merry Christmas to you, sir, I'm sure. Thank you. You want the whole day off tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, it's sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I stopped you half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, wouldn't you? Hmm? But you don't think me ill-used if I pay a day's wages for no work, do you? Hmm? It is only once a year, sir. It's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Yes, sir. I'm sure I'm very sorry, sir, to cause you such an inconvenience. It's the family more than me, sir. They put their hearts into Christmas, as it were, sir. Yes, and put their hands into my pocket, as it were, sir. Uh, I suppose you better the whole day. But be back all the earlier next morning. I will indeed, sir. Thank you, sir. It's more than generous of you, sir. Yes, I know it is. You don't have to tell me. A Merry Christmas, sir. A Merry Christmas, sir. You, a clerk, and 15 shillings a week with a wife and a family, talking about a Merry Christmas. <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. lights on the graveyard, on the headstones, on the entrance cave, Dewey went uh, a little, ah, never mind, it's all right, this is the holiday season, and with that being said, from us to you, all my ghoulsters out there, we want to wish you each a Merry Christmas and a happy, ah, <laughs> Oh, a happy holidays from us to you. Waiter, 
Yes. More bread. Take me extra, sir. No more bread. Yes. Can you sit down? I can. Well, do it then. You don't believe in me. <laughs> I don't. 
don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You, you might be an undigested bit of beef. <laughs> a piece of cheese. A fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave in you. Whatever you are. Do you see that toothpick? I do. You're not looking at it. But I see it notwithstanding. Oh. Well then, I've, I've just got to swallow this and I'd be tortured for the rest of my life by a legion of hobgoblins. <laughs> all of my own creation. It's all humbug, I tell you. <laughs> Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? Yes, I do, I do, I do, I do. I must. But why do you walk the earth? And why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. If it goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. <laughs> cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. Why are you fitted? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will. I wore it. You have my sympathy. Ah. You do not know the weight and length of strong chain you bear yourself. It was full as heavy and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago, and you have labored on it since her. It is a ponderous chain. Mark me! In life, my spirit never roved beyond the limits of our money-changing home. Now I am doomed to wander without rest or peace. Incessant torture, remorse. <laughs> but it was only that you were a good man of business, Jacob. Business! Mankind was my business. Their common welfare was my business. And it is at this time of the rolling year I suffer most. Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I come tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Thank you, Jacob. You were always a good friend of mine. You will be visited by three spirits. What? Was that the chance of hope that you mentioned, Jacob? It was. Oh, well, in that case, never mind. I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first when the bell tolls one. Look to see me no more.
Morris, you know, this time of year back in the uh, Victorian age uh, was a time where people would gather around the hearth and relate ghost stories with each other. I mean, tonight's feature was by Lewis Carroll, and this was one of the uh, traditions that they held in those days was telling of the ghost story, even more so, as much so as Santa Claus or Krampus <laughs> coming down the chimney, bringing toys and stuff. Uh, there were just so many uh, stories of family stories as well. In fact, I think I will bring out the old EMF meter. I Actually, it's not old. I just got it uh, about a month ago or so, and I thought well, I'd try it out. But, you know, you never know you know who's around and if you can see the little green light at the very top here that's the uh the the reader that has to be uh uh broken so to see if we have any uh spirits or thereabouts or things lurking about especially around this time of year december when all the spirits uh, and the veils are thinnest, just like back in Halloween. And it's actually where uh, part of the the stories of Halloween came from. They sort of took a little from uh, Thanksgiving and a little bit from Christmas, and they added it into the harvest time of of uh, Samhain. And they, you know, so and the, we have Halloween, the modern day age of telling. Uh, stories of ghosts so we'll continue it here at the manor uh, checking out ghosts you know that's just to see if there's any spirits or what have you lurking about can you break our little sensor here can you turn it on can you can you do anything if you break it and make it go yellow it'll be uh, for yes and if you don't do anything it'll be for no Hmm. Well, so far, no. <laughs> I guess they, they just don't want to talk, eh, Boris? Well, anyway, that's a little tidbit for uh, Yule traditions, especially a monster traditions. Bring out your old EMF meter and see what you can, uh, what you can do about it the spirits that's hanging around. <laughs> spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past. No, your past. What is your business here with me? Your welfare. <laughs> My welfare. Your reclamation, then. Take heed, rise, and walk with me. Through the window. Are you afraid? I... I, I am a mortal, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand and you shall be upheld in more than this. You know this. 
this place, do it. I was a boy here. They are but shades of the things that have been. They do not know we are here. Look, there's my old school. How lonely and deserted it looks. Not quite deserted. A solitary boy, yourself, Ebenezer, forgotten by his friends, is left there still. I know. just before she died. Perhaps that is what has changed his mind towards you. He spoke to me so gently one night when I was going to bed that I wasn't afraid to ask him just once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a carriage to bring you. And you're never to come back here anymore. And you're never to be lonely again. Never to be lonely again. Never, as long as I live. Well, then you must live forever, Fan. Nobody else ever cared for me. Nobody else ever will. You must live forever, Fan. Oh, dear brother, what nonsense. Everyone loves you very much. You must forgive Papa and forget the past. For our dearest mother's sake. Oh, Fan. Bring down Master Scrooge's box. Our sister was always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. She had. She died a married woman and had, I think, children. What a child. True, your nephew. She died giving him life. As your mother died giving you life, for which your father never forgave you, as if you were to blame. It's old physics. I was apprenticed here. Look, there's old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig. Top couple. What does this party cost him in your mortal money? Three or four pounds at most. Is that so much that he deserves your praise? Oh, but it's not that. The happiness he gave to us, his clerks and apprentices and everybody who knew him was as great as if it had, as if it had cost a fortune. What's the matter? Nothing. Something, I think. No, no, no. Just that I'd like to have a word with my own clerk, Bob Cratchit, just now. That's all. Turn and see yourself in love, Ebenezer Scrooge. It's only a shilling ring, Alice, but one day it'll be a gold one. Oh, when I'm rich enough. Oh, it's a beautiful ring. Oh, but I mustn't accept it. Why not? Because it's not good enough for you. Oh, no, no. no because I'm not rich enough for you. Oh, of course not. You're still so young. You may have a change of heart one day. Dearest Alice. If ever I have a change of heart towards you, it'll 
be because my heart has ceased to beat. <laughs> And it makes no difference that I'm poor. I love you because you're poor, not proud and foolish. Will you always feel like that? For as long as I live. Longer. Forever and ever. Then I accept your ring. Alice. to eternity, we two and as one. I've seen enough. Yet more waits I you. won't look. You shall. Now see yourself in business, Ebenezer. Come, come, Mr. Fezziwig. We're good friends, I think, besides good men of business. We're men of vision and progress. Why don't you sell out while the going is good? You'll never get a better offer. This is the age of the machine and the factory and the vested interests. We small traders are old history, Mr. Fezziwig. <laughs> Dodos. Yes, sir, I dare say we are. And the offer is a very large one, I have to admit. But it's not just for money alone that one spends a lifetime building up a business, Mr. Jorky. <laughs> well, if it isn't, I'd like you to tell me what you do spend a lifetime building up a business for. It's to preserve a way of life that one knew and loved. No, I can't see my way to selling out to the new vested interests, Mr. Jorky. I'll have to be loyal to the old ways and die out with them if needs must. Well, <laughs> you know what they say about time and tide, Mr. Fezziwig? They wait for no one. There's more in life than money, sir. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Fezziwig, sir. Uh, yes, yes, my boy? The foreman would appreciate a word with you if you can spare the time, sir. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Excuse me a moment. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, can you, Mr. Scrooge? Nor teach the leopard to change its spots. Well, I... I think I know what Mr. Fezziwig means, though, sir. Oh, so you hate progress and money, too, do you? Well, no, I don't hate them, sir, but... Well, perhaps the machines aren't such a good thing for mankind, after all. Sage and onions, my dear fellow. Ha! Gammon and spinach. Why, suppose I told you you could get twice the salary old Fezziwig can afford to pay you. And advancement he can't afford to offer you as a clerk in a new company. What would you say to that, eh? I, I, I'd still say money wasn't everything, sir. Oh, well, if it ain't, I don't know what is. Come and see me someday anyway, young fella. You're smart and you're no fool. That's the kind of buck they're looking for these days. <laughs> No, Spirit, not here. Yes, here. Then, it's me, your brother. Do you know me? Ebenezer, I sent for you. Promise me. I promise you what, Fan? I'll promise you anything, dearest. Only that there isn't going to be any need. You're going to get well again, Fan. No. You are. You are. Dear God, you must. Fan, you, you, you can't die. Fan, you mustn't die. You're going to get well again, Fan. Fan, you're going to get well again. You have brought me here. Have you no mercy, no pity? Ebenezer. Brother. Ebenezer. Promise me you'll take care of my boy. Promise me. 
You heard her. Forgive me, Fan. Forgive me. Forgive me, Fan. Forgive me, Fan. Buck, that's where you start. And you can work your way on up as high as the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral if you've a mind to do so. Control the cash box and you control the world. By the way, how did old Fezziwig take it when you said you were leaving him? You wish me luck, sir. No hard feelings, eh? Starting with a clean slate. Good. And now let me introduce you to your fellow clerk, Mr. Marley. Just a moment, please. Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, the new clerk, Mr. Jacob Marley, our wizard of the accounts. Your servant, Mr. Marley. Your servant, Mr. Scrooge. I'm sure you two gentlemen will get along famously. I'm sure we shall, Mr. Jorkins. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. The place, no doubt, seems new and strange to you. Somewhat. The world is on the verge of new and great changes, Mr. Scrooge. Some of them, of necessity, will be violent. Do you agree? Oh, I think the world's becoming a very hard and cruel place, Mr. Marley. One must steel oneself to survive it, not be crushed under with the weak and the infirm. I think we have many things in common, Mr. Scrooge. I hope so, Mr. Marley. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Scrooge, sir. Yes? Pardon the liberty, but do you know if I'm to be kept on here, sir? What's your present salary? Five shillings a week, sir. You can stay for four shillings a week. Well, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Isn't that old Fezziwig? Greetings, I am the Count Gordival, the host of Creature Feature, the weekly web program at www.countgord.com. And as you know by now, I'm the first horror host on the internet. So I have a very great affinity for horror hosts who use the internet to deliver their craft or their bad movies or whatever they do. So I want to take this opportunity which I very rarely do because I, as a vampire, don't really celebrate Christmas because I don't think it's appropriate. Garbage. To do this. <clears throat> to my good friend and fellow horror host, Bobby Gamonster and Boris T. Buzzard, let me, Count Gord Duvall, wish you a dreary and dreadful Christmas. And a scary, frightful New Year. <laughs> Don't get the bad stuff. <laughs> Alice. The same Alice you swore to love to all eternity, Ebenezer. She is not changed by the harshness of the world, but you are. Then you no longer love me. You no longer love me. When have I ever said that? 
In words, never. Well, in what, then? In the way you have changed. But how have I changed towards you? By changing towards the world. But it, it, it is such a terrible thing for a man to struggle with something better than he is. Another idol has replaced me in your heart. A golden idol. It's singular. The world that can be so brutally cruel to the poor professes to condemn the pursuit of wealth in the same breath. You fear the world too much. <laughs> with reason. But I, 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 I am not changed towards you. Aren't you? Our promise is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. If you had never made that promise, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Of course I would. No. If you were free today, would you choose a darless girl with, with neither wealth nor social standing, you who now weigh everything by gain? It would bring you nothing but repentance and regret. That is why I released you. You know I'm right, then. I must bow to your conviction that you are. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Thank you. I shall be. Goodbye. Show me no more. But I told you, these were but shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Take me away. Very well. But we have not done yet, Ebenezer Scrooge. We do but turn another page. And as your business prospered, Ebenezer Scrooge, a golden idol took possession of your heart, as Alice said it would. May we hear those figures, Mr. Snedgrid, uh, at your pleasure? Uh, certainly, Mr. Groper. Well, gentlemen, after 17 years of existence, the Amalgamated Mercantile Society's books show the startling figures of a liability of 3,200 pounds, eight shillings and tenpence, and a total asset of 11 pounds, eight shillings and tenpence. Well, at least the tenpences cancel each other out. How much of this is the company's capital? All of it, Mr. Rosebed. In short, sir, you're not only a bankrupt, you're an embezzler of the company's funds. I also beat my wife and skewer innocent babies when in my cups. Take a very cool attitude, if I may say so, sir. So do Mr. Scrooge and Mr. Marley. They're not facing prosecution for a capital offence. Oh, but gentlemen, it could have been any one of you. We're all cutthroats under this fancy linen, Mr. Snedrig. I must ask you to speak for yourself, Mr. Jorking. Oh, what would you gain to prosecute me? All you'd get out of it is about 11 pounds on. And to pack me off to Botany Bay would be poor compensation for the panic that would arise among the shareholders. Panic, sir? Yes, panic. Would any of you gentlemen care to deny that if this juicy little scandal leaked out now, the annual shareholders' meeting would resemble an orchestra of scorched cats? Result? Bankruptcy all around. Strike that speech out of the minutes. Yes, sir. Mr. Joking doesn't exaggerate the imprudence of allowing his misdemeanors to be made public. Are you in sympathy with Mr. Joking by any chance, Mr. Scrooge? Not, I confess, with his methods. But Mr. Marley and I have a proposition to make to the representatives of the company, which might solve some of the difficulties to our general advantage. The devil you have. You want to watch these two fellows, you know. They'd skin Jack catch alive and he'd never know they'd done it. Can we hear the proposition? Shall I be spokesman? Mr. Marley and myself are prepared to make good out of our own private resources. A sum of money appropriated by Mr. Joking. <laughs> Reprieved. Reprieved. Curfew shall not ring tonight, Mr. Snedry. Order, order. In return. We wish to be allowed the option of buying up further shares in the company to a maximum of 51% of the total. In short, gentlemen, if you wish to save the fair name of the company by accepting their generous offer, 
They become the company. Never, never. One percent. Out of the question. Never. Never. Fifty percent. Out of the question and also out of order, Mr. Scrooge. Please, your great kind self, dear. I'm to say that Mr. Marley ain't expected to live through the night and that if Mr. Scrooge wants to take his leave of him, he should nip along smartly or there won't be no Mr. Marley to take leave of, as we know the use of the word. He's breathing very queer when he does breathe at all. Excuse me, Mr. Scrooge, I'm sir. busy. It's about Mr. Marley. He's dying, sir. Well, what can I do about it? If he's dying, he's dying. Well, the message was for you to go at once, sir. It is now quarter to five. The business of the office is not yet finished. I shall go when the office is closed. At seven o'clock. Yes, sir. He'll come at seven. I'll try and get Mr. Marley to hold out till then, I'm sure. Much obliged. Good night to you. And a Merry Christmas, if it ain't out of keeping with the situation. Thank you. The same to you. find Mr. Marley well, sir. I should think that's highly unlikely. Yes, I suppose so, sir. But it seems odd to think of the place without him, sir. Why should it be any more odd than it was with him? Hmm? We've all got to die, Cratchit. I suppose you'll be wanting the whole day off tomorrow as usual. If quite convenient, sir. <laughs> every Christmas you say the same thing. And every Christmas it's just as inconvenient as it was the Christmas before. Good night. Good night, sir. Sir, the undertaker. <laughs> you don't believe in letting the grass grow under your feet, do you? Ours is a highly competitive profession, sir. Is it dead yet? I'll have another look if you like. No, don't bother. I'll see for myself. seen to you properly? Last rites and all that. Hmm? There's, uh, there's nothing I can do. Hmm? Oh? What, particularly? Well, hmm? there's still time. Time? Time, time for what? Huh? Wrong. Wrong. 
long. Oh. Well, we, we can't be right all the time. Nobody's perfect. We've been no worse than the next man. Oh, better if it comes to that. You mustn't reproach yourself, Jacob. We are wrong. What? Save yourself. What? Save myself? Save myself from what? Hmm? Speak up. One shadow more. No. No more. I, I cannot bear it. Jacob Marley worked at your side for 18 years. He was the only friend you ever had. But what did you feel when you signed the register of his burial and took his money, his house, and his few mean sticks of furniture? Did you feel a little pity for him? Look at her face, Ebenezer. A face of a wrenching, grasping, scraping, covetous old sinner. No, no, no. the pleasure had been indefinitely postponed. So? Is your heart still unmoved towards us then? I'm too old. I'm beyond hope. Go and redeem some younger, more promising creature. Leave me to keep Christmas in my own way. Mortal, we spirits of Christmas do not live only one day of our year. We live the whole 365. So is it true of the child born in Bethlehem? He does not live in men's hearts only one day of the year, but in all the days of the year. You have chosen not to seek him in your heart. Therefore, you shall come with me and seek him in the hearts of men of good will. Come, touch my robe. is this? A place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, but they know me. Come.
Cratchit. It's Bob Cratchit. She's not coming. Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? Yes, I am, Father. <laughs> I can't bear to let them tease you. Why, bless your heart. It never would have been Christmas if they'd kept you late. Is the pudding still singing in the copper, Peter? Yes, come and hear it. You come too, Mary and Belinda. You come along as well, Martha. Come and hear the pudding singing in the copper. I'll come in a minute. All right. Sit you down before the fire. And have a nice warm, the Lord bless you. We had such a deal of work to finish up last night, but I never did think I'd get away. We had to clear away this morning, and then I ran all the way so as to be here in time. How did little Tim behave in church? As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me he wasn't going to feel shy if people looked at him because he was a cripple, as it might be pleasant to them being in church to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see? He's growing strong and hearty, though, Martha, my dear. Isn't he, my love? Spirit, tell me, will, will Tiny Tim live? I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race shall find him now. Oh, no. No. Kind spirit, say that he will be spared. Why? If he'd be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Well, my little cock sparrow, he has your own stool by the fire all ready for you. They're such a goose, Martha. I'm sure of it. And the pudding. Oh, the pudding. I shan't be easy till it's eaten. I confess I have my doubts about the quantity of flour. It would be a perfect pudding, my love. A perfect pudding. <laughs> Won't it, Martha, my dear? Hey, Tim? It'll be the finest pudding in the whole of London this Christmas. And the goose will be the finest goose. And ours will be the finest Christmas. Here's the punch, all steaming hot. Oh, no, 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 Take your turn, one and all, if you please. There's enough for one toast now and another after that. Oh, there, bravo. There's bounty for you. I declare, I'd like to know how many families of our acquaintance could boast two rounds of the best gin punch. No, 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 no. Now, everybody got his drink? Yes. Yeah. Good. But before I give the toast, I have a piece of momentous information for all, and Master Peter in particular. Master Peter, now grown to full estate and dignity, a son of the house, and looking every inch the grand fellow he is in one of my own collars. <laughs> <laughs> I have waited for this great moment to advise him that I have my eye on a situation for him which will bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. Oh, tell me, you'll be quite independent gentleman now, Peter. What next, I wonder? <laughs> then a toast, my love, my dearie, to our Merry Christmas. God bless us. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Oh, no! I wish I had him here now. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast himself upon. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. It could only be on Christmas Day that I would drink the health of such a hard, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. 
Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very happy and very merry, no doubt. <laughs> he said that Christmas was humbug and he believed it too. I told him so. Well, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the poor old man. He wouldn't let me wish it to him personally, but here it is nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Oh! <laughs> well, I don't know that our drinking to him will do him much good. Nor do I. I hate him. Oh, I forbid it. I'm sorry for it. I couldn't feel angry with him if I tried. Who suffers worst from his humours? Himself, always. Look at the way he's taken it into his head to disown us without a shilling and won't even come to dinner with us. And what's the consequence? He's only cheated himself out of a highly indigestible dinner. It was a wonderful dinner. Yes, it was a wonderful dinner. Well, I'm very glad you think so, miss, because I personally haven't very much faith in these newlywed housekeepers. Have you, Tupper? Uh, alas, as a bachelor, I'm a wretched outcast with no right to express an opinion on such a tender and delicate subject. Have I? Dear, distant, unmovable Miss Flora. Now, you really are quite incorrigible, Mr. Tupper. Quite beyond hope. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Do you feel more rested now, my dear? I do. Bless your dear, gentle heart. You know me, darling, I never thought there was anyone like you left in the whole wide world. Cut me throat, rip me liver if I'm telling a lie. This is the happiest Christmas I ever had. <laughs> Alice. Alice. Spirit, are these people real or are they shadows? They're real. We're the shadows. Both of us. Did you not cut yourself off from your fellow being when you lost the love of that gentle creature? Where are you taking me now? My time with you, Ebenezer, is almost done. Will you profit by what I have shown you of the good in most men's hearts? I don't know. How can I promise? It's too hard a lesson for you to learn. Then learn this lesson. Spirit, are these yours? They are man's. They cling to me for protection from their fetters. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy. But have they no refuge, no resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? yet to come. And you're going to show me shadows of things that have not yet happened, but will happen. Spirit of the future, I fear you more than any other specter I've seen. But even in my fear, I must tell you, I am too old. I cannot change. <laughs> it's not that I am impenitent. It is just that I... Oh, wouldn't it be better if I just went home to bed? No. Lead me then. <laughs> Ooh, 
whale bores. Let's see. We have our our Black Peter statue and Saint Nicholas. We have our Krampus on a shelf. We have our Krampus greeting cards. Aren't they beautiful, everyone? <laughs> oh my, it's such a nice tin. I bring them out every year. We've almost sent all the uh, the cards out, but we still have a few. As you can see, there's Krampus and Santa Claus sitting together having a cup of tea. <laughs> Who knows? You might be a lucky recipient of uh, of a Krampus and Santa Claus uh, card this year. You never know. <laughs> and let's see. We also have a, a wonderful book that has wonderful stories about Krampus, uh, also called the Old Dark Christmas uh, Stories and Tales. It, it has wonderful pictures in it, right, Boris? It, let's see. Oh, here's a beautiful one of Krampus, of a version of Krampus that uh, they have in the uh, Netherlands. Can you? Ah, yes, there it is. <laughs> Indeed, and there's, it's filled full of, well, you can see how thick it is. It's, it's filled full of stories and tales of Krampus. And let's see, we have a comic book called Krampus, uh, the Shadow of St. Nicholas. And um, who, was, who, who did this? Uh, inspired by the major motion picture. So that was from the... Uh, the motion picture Krampus that was about out a few years ago. See, with such wonderful colors and scary, uh, oh, scary little tale it was. <laughs> anyway, that's something to think about uh, as a present to give to your little monsterling. And, w oh, it's talking about the uh, Krampus on the shelf. You know, it's like Elf on the Shelf, only you have Krampus and you have the wonderful little kids right there in the very back and it comes with a Krampus well actually it's called Krampus in the corner <laughs> and it's a wonderful little bedtime jingle um, okay let's see what's but just a little bit from the back okay if I can yes it's that time of year the air is growing chilly and crisp Someone is making a list and checking it twice. That someone is watching, and he's not at all nice. <laughs> it's not old St. Nick, but a beast known as the Krampus. He is lurking just out of sight, waiting for you to misbehave. He's prepared to punish, torture, and maim, and he really enjoys his job. This season, Krampus has a new plan to keep track of your sins in a harmless little doll. <laughs> and that, my dear folks, is this little doll right here. So, <laughs> you best behave. You best be wary. Krampus <laughs> will make you merry. <laughs> Let's get back to tonight's feature. Hmm? He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrows that flyeth by day. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Shall I stop reading? No, no. It's only the color. It hurts my eyes. They're better now. It makes them weep by candlelight. And I wouldn't show your father weak eyes when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. 
But he seems to be walking a little slower than he used these last few evenings. Oh, I've known him walk with Tiny Tim on his shoulder very fast indeed. So have I. Often. But so have I. So have I. But then he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so it was no trouble. No trouble. I'm a little late, my dear. Please forgive me. You must be cold and tired. Sit near the fire. No, no, I'm very content, my dear. Very content. I went to see the place where he will rest. It's sheltered by green trees, my dear, and very quiet and still. It was strange, but as I stood there, I felt his hand slip in mine as if he was standing beside me and comforting me. I felt very peaceful, my dear. He was telling me, you see, in his own little way, that he's happy. Truly happy now, and that we must cease to grieve for him and try to be happy too. Oh, dear. My tiny Tim. Oh, Robert, my Lord. Oh, Robert. Go first. No, no, dear. You was here first. After you, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, look, old Joe, he's a chance. If a child lady and the laundress and the undertaker haven't all met here at the same time without meaning it. Well, you couldn't have met in a better place. Let's go into the parlour. You were made free a bit long ago, eh? And the other two aren't strangers. Eh? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Just like shut the door of the shop, eh? Just shut the door of the shop. Oh, how it screeks! There's not a rusty piece of metal in the face like its own hinges. And I'm sure there are no old bones here like mine. <laughs> We're all suitable to our calling. <laughs> We're all well met. Come into the parlour. Come into the parlour. <laughs> Who goes first? What odds now? We're all met at the once. Everyone's got a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Oh, that's true enough. No one more so. Why, then, don't stand staring as if you was a frayed woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed. No, oh, we hope not. <laughs> Very well, then. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> if he wanted to keep them after he was dead, why wasn't he amiable in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody with him when he was struck mm. with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there alone be himself. Yeah, there never was a truer word spoke. It was a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier one, and it would have been if I could have laid my hands on anything else. We knew pretty well we was helping ourselves before we come here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. No, no, I'll go first. Just to show we all got trust in one another. It's very polite of you, I do grant, I'm sure. Watch, fob, seal, pencil case, sleeve buttons, brooch. Yes. Eight shillings this lot, and I wouldn't give you another sixpence. Not if I was boiled for life for not doing it. Who's next? Always the lady, dear. I shall have to insist you all stop and watch mine, now that we're so open and above with each other. Two sheets, yeah. two towels, yeah. shirt, yeah. teaspoons, two silver, yeah. sugar tongs, boots assorted, four. Yeah, seventeen and six. I always give too much to a lady, it's a weakness of mine. That's how I come to ruin myself. Yeah, if you ask for another penny, made it an open question, I'd regret my liberality. Knock off half a crown. <laughs> Now open my bundle, Joe. Come on, what's in it? 
Hey. You wait and see. Yeah. Bed curtains. Bed curtains? Ah, uh -huh. bed curtains. But you... Don't you say you took these down, rings and all, and... Oh, him lying there? Yes, I do. Why not? <laughs> you was born to make a fortune, ma'am, and you, you certainly will. I certainly won't hold back my hand when I can get something in it. For sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe. At least his blankets, too. Who's else, do you think? He ain't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. <laughs> he didn't die of anything <laughs> catching, Oh, did he? don't you be afraid of that. Yeah. I wasn't too fond of his company. I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. And you can look through that till your eyes ache and you won't find a hole in it. It's the best one he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you mean, wasted it? Well, they'd have buried him in it, of course. <laughs> but I took it off of him again. As if Calico ain't good enough for burying. Anyway, it's just as becoming to the body. He couldn't have looked uglier than what he did in this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's poetic justice. <laughs> he frightened everybody away from him when he was alive, and now he benefits us when he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. So did he, I dare say. What's he done with all his money? Left it to his company. Where else? He didn't leave it to me. That's all I know. Well, the funeral won't cost much, that's certain. Upon my soul, I can't think of anyone who'll go to it. I don't mind going, if there's a luncheon provided. But I must be fed, or else I stay at home. I know those men. They're men of business, very wealthy, very important. Whose funeral were they talking about? Strange. My usual place is over there, under the clock. I ought to be there this time of day. But I'm not. I'm not. Stone, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that must be? Or are the only shadows of things that might be? I know that men's deeds foreshadow certain ends, but if the deeds be departed from, surely the ends will change. Tell me to sow with what you show me now. Show me all this land beyond all hope. Oh, pity me, spirit, pity me, and help me. Help me to sponge away the writing on this stone if I repent. And I do repent, I do repent. I'll make good the wrongs I've done my fellow men. And I'll change. I'm not the man I was. I'm not the man I was. Believe me, believe me, I'm not the man I was. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
morning, sir. Tell me, what day is it? What day? Well, it's Christmas Day, of course, Christmas sir. Day, Christmas Day, Christmas Day. Then I haven't missed it. <laughs> the spirits must have done everything in one night. <laughs> of course, they can do anything, can't they? Of course they can. <laughs> <laughs> Are you quiet yourself, sir? What? I don't know. No, I, I don't think so. I hope not. What? <laughs> the curtains are still here. They're still here. You didn't, you didn't tear them down and sell them. Hmm? They're, they're here now. Everything's here. I'm here. <laughs> And the shadows of things that would be can still be dispelled. And they will be. I know they will be. I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm as light as a feather. Oh. I'm as happy as a I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. <laughs> I'm as giddy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. I, I never <laughs> A Merry Christmas, Ebenezer! <laughs> you old humbug! And a happy new year, as if you deserved it. Oh, ah! Merry, Merry Christmas, Mrs. Dilber. Thank you, you sir. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And many, many of them. Ah! Ah! Likewise. <laughs> Look, Mrs. Dilber, there's the corner where the spirit of Christmas present sat. And there's the door where Jacob Marley's ghost came through. And there's the window where I saw the wandering spirit. It's right, it's true, it all happened to her. I don't know what day of the month it is. I, I don't know how long I've been amongst the spirits. I, I don't know anything. I never did know anything. <laughs> but now I know that I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything. I never did know anything. But now I know that I don't know all of the Christmas morning. I must stand in my head. I must stand in my head. <laughs> do I pay you? Two shillings a week. What? Two shillings? It's forthwith raised to ten. Ten shillings a week here? You sure you don't want to see a doctor? A doctor? Certainly not. Nor the undertaker. <laughs> now off you go and enjoy yourself. Like a good girl. Bob's your uncle! <laughs> Street but one. I should hope so. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Uh, tell me, have they sold the prize turkey that was hanging there, not the little turkey, the big one? What, the one as big as me? Yes. <laughs> A delightful boy. Uh, uh, yes, my buck, the one as big as you. It's hanging there still. Is it? Very well, then go and buy it. What, cur? Uh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm in earnest. Tell the butcher to bring it here, and I'll give him the name of the party he's to send it to. Come back with the butcher and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. <laughs> An enchanting boy. 
I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. That's what I'll do. He'll never dream where it came from. <laughs> now, let me see. I must have a label. Label, 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 label. Label. <laughs> it's, it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. <laughs> Mr. Robert Cratchit, 2 Porter Street, Camden Town. That's you, Robert. These traces, no one else I know of. I think I know who sent it. Who? Who? Mr. Scrooge. Oh, dear, oh, dear, whatever made you think it might be him? I don't know. I just think it. What would make Mr. Scrooge take such leave of his senses suddenly? Christmas? Huh? <laughs> well, what do we have here? Well, we got a package. Bills, bills, ah, whatever. <laughs> oh, well, hello there. <laughs> Dr. Paul Bear here. And I just went out to the old mailbox and uh, had a parcel. And there's no name on it, so I guess I better go ahead and open it up now. Should I shake it, make sure everything's okay? Nah, if it's been through the parcel service, it's partially here. <laughs> well, let's see what we got here. Well, hey, there's a gift inside here. To Dr. Paul from Bobby Gamonster and Boris. <laughs> I must open this right now. Wow! It's Bobby's new book. You know, I saw him promoting this on CNN last week. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and read it right now. <laughs> wow! Horror hosting for dummies. Let's see here. It says, learn to get rich quick. Take a proper swing at the paparazzi. <laughs> Say no to celebrity guest requests. Crush the competition using a pencil, an onion, and car wax. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. Getting rich as a horror host. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought that was a joke. <laughs> Chapter two. How to hijack another horror host show. Well, I think I'm safe. I don't see a well-hung chicken in here. <laughs> Chapter 3. Learn how to get distribution by holding the network president's daughter hostage. Shh. Will you be quiet back there? <laughs> no. Chapter 4. Using threats and violence to garner better ratings. And Chapter 5. How to remove a restraining order against you. Uh, how about we <laughs> start with this one? <laughs> oh, wow. This is going to be fantastic reading here. I'd like to shout out a very Merry Christmas to Bobby Gamonster and his scary canary Boris. <laughs> and always remember, I'll be lurking for you. <laughs> wow. He's not lying. Maybe I can get rich quick. Young man, I 
Uncle Ebenezer. Fred, is it too late to accept your invitation to dinner? Too late? I'm delighted, delighted. My dear, look who it is. Can you forgive a pig-headed old fool for having no eyes to see with, no ears to hear with, all these years? Yes, you dear uncle. You've made Fred so happy. Bless you. Dennis, poker. Hatchet, you're late. Sir, what do you mean by coming in here this time of day? Hmm? I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time, sir. <laughs> you are indeed. Step this way, Mr. Cratchit, please. It's only once a year, sir. It won't be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. <laughs> I'm sure you were. Well, we won't beat about the bush, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. Which leaves me no alternative but to raise your salary. <laughs> I haven't taken leave of my senses, Bob. I've come to them. From now on, I want to try to help you to raise that family of yours. If you'll let me. Well, we'll, we'll talk it over later, Bob, over a, over a bowl of hot punch. Hmm? Yeah. Meanwhile, you, you just go and put some more coal in that fire. You go straight out and buy a new coal scuttle. Isn't yes, you do that before you dot another I, Bob Cratchit? <laughs> <laughs> as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever knew, or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. And to tiny Tim, who lived and got well again, he became a second father. Uncle Scrooge! And it was always said that he knew how to keep Christmas well, if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.
Tis the season to be unjolly. Fa la 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 la. Oh, everybody's stoked on Holly. Ha 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 ha. You know, the ending always just puts a cheer and festive note in my cockles and spines, as it were. Right, Boris? You too? <laughs> I mean, after all, the you didn't think there for a second that. Um, that old Scrooge was going to, to cave in, you know, and, and do the right thing. <laughs> well, this type of time of year, I guess you have to, to do the right thing, as it were. <laughs> so, you know, and Tiny Tim, you know, being a second father to him and taking him to the hospitals and all that type of thing. And, oh, I just, you know, spirits and ghosts and, and, Rotten old Scrooge that turns nice. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that type of film. It just sort of gets to you. You too, Boris? Yes. Well, my dear fiends, I hope you enjoyed tonight's little feature. And I hope that you're having a wonderfully unjolly, unholly, and anything with an ollie in it type of season. <laughs> and until next year, as always, until we see you again in 2012, 2012, no, 2012 has gone away, 2021. <laughs> I was thinking of our 12th season in 2021. Until we see you then in January, as always, keep screaming. <laughs>